Thank you so much, guys. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, let's turn to Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2, and we're going to look at verse 19 down to verse number 30. Philippians chapter number 2 and verses 19 down to verse number 30. We are going to turn our attention this morning to a subject that is not often as talked about as it should be from the pulpit, and that is friendship. I was thinking as I was preparing the message this week, this morning's message this week, how thankful I am for the simplicity of God's Word at times. We often, I think, gather together expecting to hear great, deep theological truths on a regular basis. We hope to open up our scriptures and have something just mind-blowing, you know, or at least that's what I think you are hoping for every Sunday morning. Uh, We gather together, just kind of come together hoping that something just revolutionary is going to come and we're going to hear something that we have never heard before. And don't get me wrong, there is a need for such uh, in the church and specifically in the preaching and teaching ministry because God's Word is uh, God's revealed truth about Himself, isn't it? God's Word is, uh, every last line of God's Word is a statement about Himself. It's getting us to know the very mind of God, which is unsearchable, the psalmist says. And so, oftentimes when we gather together, there's these deep theological truths that we uncover, that we look at. But God also, in His Word, sometimes just gives us a simple roadmap to life. Sometimes He gives us just some simple truths to live by, that if we would just apply them, they would revolutionize the way we live in the world. As we've worked our way through the book of Philippians, this letter to the Philippians, we have discussed at length, at great length, the power of the gospel in the community. And we're going to continue to discuss that this morning as we look at the power of friendship in the gospel. You could really summarize Paul's message to the Philippians to this point By saying, first of all, that Paul was concerned for the church as they were awaiting news of his incarceration, his imprisonment, and how that news, that that imprisonment might affect the church itself. Would the church be damaged by his incarceration? Would they flee? Would they shrink back in fear? How were they going to respond to what was going on to him? Then Paul took up the issue of encouraging the church to find unity. Not simply through compromise or community building exercises, but unity as their minds and their hearts were united in the truth of the gospel. And then finally, we saw that that unity that he wanted them to have was developed through their modeling of the character of Christ. That they would uh, clothe themselves in humility, in in selflessness, in, uh, in sacrifice in working out their salvation, in that process of sanctification, becoming more like Jesus Christ, working out that salvation day by day, Paul saw that as the unifying factor in the church. So to this point, really you could say that everything he's written about is the power of the gospel. Whether it is the gospel that gives them hope, the gospel that is being proclaimed even in his imprisonment, whether it is the gospel that is binding them together as a people, whether it is the gospel that is changing them on a daily basis, which then gives power and strength to their unity, everything to this point is about the gospel and its effect, the message of Jesus Christ and its effect on how the people were supposed to live with one another. Did you know that the what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary is supposed to change the way we look at one another? It's supposed to change the way we react with one another. It's supposed to change the way that we view our brothers and sisters. Now, we should not be surprised then, if this has been Paul's message, that he would turn his attention to one of the most intimate relationships that man knows, and that is the relationship of friendship. Especially when you consider how important the role of friendship is in the local church. Tom Rayner, head of the Lifeway Research Institute, says that 97% of 353 people interviewed, 97% of people chose to visit a church based on relationships, based on friendships. And 57% said that friendship was the determining factor on whether or not they were going to join that local congregation. See, you thought it was all the preacher's fault why people weren't joining. But no, it's your fault, right? 
57% of people said it was the determining factor when they decided whether or not they were going to join a church. Paul understood the importance of friendship, the role that friendship plays in the local congregation. And so he wanted to give the people a healthy view of what friendship was supposed to look like, especially because of the work of Jesus Christ. I like what C.S. Lewis said about friendship. He said that friendship is when that moment when two people, one person says to, or when two people meet and one person says to the other, what? You two? I thought I was the only one like that until I met you. That's what friendship is supposed to be, right? Uh, this morning we want to turn our attention to that. We want to see uh, two friendships that the Apostle Paul will illustrate for us. When we are, and when we are done, I want us to consider two questions. The first is, what do these friendships teach us about the nature of our relationship with other believers? And second of all, what do these friendships teach us about the nature of the gospel itself and to the church? Let's look at this first friendship, and you are not surprised by his name. His name was Timothy. Beginning in verse number 19, the apostle writes, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him to you just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also with you. If you have ever been in church or if you've been in church for any length of time over the years, somewhere along the way you have probably heard the name Timothy. And in fact, you probably know to associate it with the Apostle Paul because it's always Paul and Timothy in his letters. But what do we know about this Timothy? Well, obviously he was an important figure in the life of the Apostle for two letters are written directly to him that bear his name in our New Testament. Not only that, but in almost every writing that Paul does in the New Testament, he at some point mentions his relationship with Timothy. So important, somehow they are important. Somehow they have a, a niche, a relationship with one another that has somehow served to further the gospel and encourage one another as they serve the Lord Jesus Christ. What we know about Timothy in Philippians is a little bit different. Here in Philippians 2, Paul introduces Timothy as something interesting. He introduces him as a bridge between the apostle and his church. The, a bridge between the pastor and his people, as it were. Timothy apparently served an important function between the Philippians and Paul as though it were helping one another communicate effectively with each other. In verse 19, Paul writes, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by the news of you. I think the key phrase in that verse is that additional or that, that initial uh, statement. He says that I hope in the Lord Jesus. It was Paul's desire in this moment to send word to the Philippians. They were worried about his imprisonment. They were concerned about his health. They were concerned about his welfare. And so he desired to send word to them that everything was going quite well. But it was also his desire, as the bridge works, it goes both ways, that the, he would hear back from the Philippians of their love and affection for him, but also of the continual work of the gospel in the church of Philippi and its community. But he was ever a dependent apostle. Sometimes we get the wrong view of Paul. He was not some spiritual giant that, real, that didn't think he ever needed anyone's help. Paul knew immensely in his ministry that he was dependent upon other people and a power that was greater than himself. And so he opens up in verse 19 by saying that he hoped in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy. What does that mean? What does that little word hoped mean? Well, is he simply trying to be poetic? Oftentimes, the apostle will write and say that he hoped in the gospel, that he hoped in grace, that he hoped in the Lord Jesus for ex uh, certain things to be done. But in this case, no. In fact, this is one of the only occasions in which the apostle connects the phrase that he hoped in the Lord Jesus to the sending of an individual. In other words, what he was saying in this moment was, I desire... 
to send Timothy to you to act as a bridge where I might communicate effectively with you, where he might tell me of what's going on in your lives and he might tell you of what's going on in my life. But then he was saying in this moment, I hope or I'm trusting in the Lord Jesus while I desire to send Timothy to you. I'm not sure whether or not it is a part of God's sovereign and providential plan. You see, the apostle is teaching us, even in this friendship, a lesson that all of us need to know. And that is that none of us controls our faith. None of us controls our days. The apostle had learned somewhere along the way never to make even the slightest of plans without first depending wholly on the care of Christ. He would not presume in this moment that he could send Timothy or that God would allow him to send a letter. He prayed that God would make it possible for him to send Timothy, but the ability to do so was totally up to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a testimony of a life so rooted in the care of God that the very notion of a movement was first bathed in reflection and contemplation and dependence upon God. Beloved, it made me stop for a moment and ask if I am that dependent upon God this morning. Oftentimes in situations, we find ourselves in positions where we believe that we know how to handle a given situation. You know what I mean? We know, we believe that we know how to answer a challenge. We believe that we know what we should do. And oftentimes what we do, or at least what I do, is I oftentimes will act without depending upon the care of God. I might depend on the care of a doctor or I might depend on the care of a nurse. I might uh, act with the, depending on the care of my spouse or my church or my friends. But most of the time, a lot of times, not most of the time, but a lot of times, I am challenged in myself to be dependent upon Christ and I will fail. I want to depend on my own strength, my own merit, my own wisdom, my own abilities, right? But Paul understood whether it through, be through experience or whether it be through the revelation of God to him directly, he understood that that was not supposed to be the activity of God's people. You see, those who are most strong in Christ are those who are most dependent upon him. They are most weak in themselves. Paul did not say, I will send Timothy to you, but that I hoped in the Lord Jesus. In other words, I am trusting in the sovereign care and provision of God that one day I'll be able to send him to you. Verse number 20, he says, For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. The reason that Paul wanted the Lord Jesus to send Timothy was twofold. First of all, he says, because I have no one like him. It could be translated in the Greek literally, I have no one of an equal soul. I have no one just like him. I have no one of the same nature and character. When Paul looked at his friend Timothy and he looked at his steadfast character, his response to the gospel and his contribution to the ministry, Paul said, I've got nobody quite like him. Now, that's not like when your pastor says there's nobody quite like Cornerstone, all right? There are, there are different meanings of the phrase, right? There's nobody quite like you. Could be good or bad. It could be a compliment or it could be not such a compliment, right? But Paul was saying in this moment and as a compliment, I, there is nobody, there is a, no one of equal soul to Timothy. There's no one of his very nature and character. He had seen Timothy over the years, and he had ministered to him. He had discipled him. And he said, there's nobody quite like him. Now, that wasn't to say that there were not others that, that Paul could have sent. There, it's not to say that there weren't other great men and women, even for that matter. We know through his testimony that he had all kinds of great men and women who followed him in his journeys, and, and, and he could have sent any one of them. But in this moment, Paul, when he had a choice to make, he said, there's nobody quite like Timothy, and so that's the one that I'm hoping in the Lord Jesus, that I'm hoping that God's sovereign plan will allow for me to send him because I can trust his proven word. So he would send, he would be sent by the apostle because he had great confidence that Timothy would do what was right and act as though he were even the apostle himself. Second, he was sending Timothy because Paul had no one else, he said, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. 
The word there, genuine, speaks of a purity. In other words, it speaks of being without guile or deceit. He says, I not only want to send Timothy to you because he, I know his proven worth, not only because I know that he is uh, uh, like no other man, not only because there's no soul that is comparable to him, but I also want to send Timothy because he is genuine. He's pure. He's without deceit. He's without guile. He was sending Timothy in this moment because he knew not only of his actions, but catch this, he was saying of Timothy, I know of his heart. I know what's deep down inside of him. I know what drives him, what makes him tick, what what makes him think about some things. Beloved, we could learn lessons there as well because oftentimes we judge people by their actions when we don't always have a full understanding of those actions. We don't know what's on the inside of a person. In fact, over the years I have said sometimes we have to trust leadership, whether that be a a finance team, a personnel team, or whoever it may be. We have to trust them not based on what we know of a situation, but rather the character and the persons involved. We have to sometimes not know everything about the situation, but simply trust the very nature, the people themselves, because we know what's in their heart. Paul was saying that about Timothy. He was saying that Timothy was genuine, pure. He was without deceit. Taken with the connection of the first words that I have no one like him. Paul was saying that there was no one else in in the world. There was no one else in his imprisonment who was able to stand in for him, for the Philippians, as Timothy could do. It could have been an indictment on the loneliness of the apostle. He could be saying in this moment, I'm just terribly lonely. Or it could be that the apostle was simply pointing out the great companionship that God had provided for him in Timothy. But I think it's more of a commendation. Because verse 21 says, For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Paul was saying in this moment, Others would betray you. Others would lead you astray. Others would seek their own selfish gain. But I'm going to send Timothy because Timothy is without deceit and guile. There is no soul like him. He will do what is right in your sight. That could lead us into an interesting discussion this morning. Obviously, the Apostle Paul and Timothy had a special relationship. How does one develop those types of relationships? How does one develop a relationship that they become the man or woman that a church trusts? How does a person develop a relationship that they become the man or woman that the pastor trusts that says, go ahead and go and stand in my stead? How does a person develop that type of relationship that other people say, I don't know everything, but I know you and I can trust you to go and to stand in my place? Well, Paul gives us the answer to that. Verse 22 But you know Timothy's proven worth. Did you hear that word, proven worth? How is a son with a father? He has served me with the gospel. First, he says that Timothy had proven worth, a track record, as it were, a history of value. Second, he says that he had a special relationship. Like a son with a father, he has served me in the gospel. In my home growing up, we had a family business that my grandfather started, I think, close to 75 years ago now. It's been a long, long time. And I can remember, as in every family business, there are days that are not as good as other days, right? And anybody who has ever worked with family understands exactly what I'm talking about. There's a natural tendency not to always agree with family members. I can remember watching my dad and my grandfather argue about things. Watching my dad and my grandfather have discussions about what was the proper way to handle something. And my grandfather would always say, one day this business is going to be yours and I need to know that I can trust you with it. And my father would say, I've worked worked here for 35 years. If you can't trust me with it, then don't ever give it to me in the first place, right? And around and around the discussions would go. And my grandfather was essentially saying, son, I want you to act as though I would act. And the son was saying, I don't need to act like you act because I'm not you. In this moment, Paul draws on that same type of illustration and he says, like a father and son, we've got that kind of relationship. Did that mean that Timothy would do everything that Paul had done? No. It meant that Timothy was trusted by the apostle. He had been like a father to him, that Paul would trust that Timothy, even if he might do it differently than his father, had so learned from his father that he would do what was right. 
I believe the key component there, as you look at those things, then becomes spelled in four letters. T-I-M-E. Time. Verse 23 and 24, I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. Notice again the phrase, I trust in the Lord. I am dependent upon God's provision. How do you develop those types of relationships? How do you develop a relationship where others trust you, where others believe in you, and that others will allow you to stand in their place? How do you develop a relationship with leadership, with pastors, so that they will put you in their stead? How do you develop a relationship with leadership, with a church? How do you develop a relationship where others can say, I know that in my absence I can trust this person, and the answer is time, beloved. It takes time. Timothy had proven himself. Timothy had walked with the apostle like a son walks with the father. And Paul knew that it was all a part of God's sovereign care. That leads us to the second friend that is mentioned. And that is in verses 25 down to verse number 30. A man by the name of Epaphroditus. I have thought it necessary, he writes in verse 25. To send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill even near unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Paul says that Epaphroditus was apparently sent by the church of Philippi to minister to him. Presumably, Epaphroditus, as we have seen before, came uh, to bring some encouragement to the apostle, to bring monies and gifts, to receive a report as to Paul's welfare in the midst of his imprisonment. He came to enjoy time and to sit with him, as it were, in the cell. Apparently, during that journey and labor, they were, it was so intensive that he fell ill. Remember that their travel in their day wasn't like today. They didn't just hop in a car and drive down the road. It was an arduous journey. And apparently, during that journey, Epaphroditus got so sick that Paul says he was even nearing unto death. The church at Philippi was concerned about their beloved brother. We don't know exactly how they had heard, or maybe it was that they had not heard anything at all. But their love for Epaphroditus and the love that the apostle shows for Epaphroditus is undeniable in this moment. Not only are they distressed over what may be going on and the messages that they're having, but there are other things at play as well. The apostle is distressed that the members of, uh, or I'm sorry, Epaphroditus is distressed over the membership at Philippi. He's worried about what they think. He's laying there on his deathbed and he's saying, I hope that they aren't worried about me. I hope that they're not consumed with how things might be going. What a picture of humility. Epaphroditus said, you know what? I may be sick, I may even be dying, but I'm more concerned about what other people are doing. When he was near unto death, he was more worried about those whom he was trying to serve than he was himself. Second, The apostle says that if he had died, if Epaphroditus had died, it would have added more sorrow upon sorrow. So there was a relationship there as well. Apparently he and Paul had a kinship, a bondship. And he says in this moment that if Epaphroditus had died, I don't know if I would have been able to make it. It would have added sorrow upon sorrow. And so God has had mercy on me. Paul then says, the apostle then says that he hopes That he will send back Epaphroditus soon so that the people may rejoice with him. But what I love so much about those few verses about this man that we, this character that we know so little about, is that we get a picture of his character, which is instrumental in our understanding of what friendship is supposed to look like. Let me show you what I mean. First of all, Paul says that he is my brother, which speaks to their mutual and shared faith. In Jesus Christ. Did you know we are brothers and sisters today? We are something more than friends. We are family. In fact, I tried to get Brother Mark to sing We Are Family this morning, but he thought it was entirely inappropriate. We are family, beloved. 
We are more, because of the blood of Jesus Christ spilled on our behalf, we are more than just friends. We are family. Because of their shared faith in Jesus Christ, there was a bond that had been brought. He was regarded as a family member, as there is something special about those who are of the same faith. In fact, Psalm 133 says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Let me say it again because it's said with an exclamation point. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Did you know God commands a blessing when his people live in unity? There's something special, there's something uniting about a people who have a shared faith. That's what C.S. Lewis was talking about when he said that friendship is born at that moment when one person says to another, what? I thought I was the only one, right? You see, when we are joined together in faith in Jesus Christ, we may have very many differences in the world, but something bonds us together. We can look at each other and know that there is something different. I like the quote I read this week on social media from Oscar Wilde. He said that love is a song that only one other person can hear. It's a, it's a song that, that only I can hear when my spouse sings it, so to speak. Beloved, it is the same truth in the gospel. Only you and I know of the precious work of Jesus Christ. Others may know of it intellectually or may challenge it philosophically, but only you and I, through our shared faith in Christ, know the song that the other is singing. Second, he was not only a brother... But he says that he was also a fellow worker. I like this one the most. In fact, I want you to highlight it and underline it, all right? We should never be in need of more volunteers. Do you hear what he called Epaphroditus? A fellow worker. He did not sit idly by and allow everybody else to do the work. Rather, Epaphroditus pitched in and did his job in the kingdom of God. He had shared the experiences with Paul and the people and he sought to help his fellow man and to serve him, to serve his brothers and sisters. Not only was he a brother, not only was he a fellow worker, Paul then says that he is also a fellow soldier. It is the strongest of terms, the strongest of descriptions that could be used. A brother has a special bond. A fellow worker shares the experiences, but a soldier shares the scar. Epaphroditus was one who was engaged in the battle. As a side note, I love this because most of the time we think of pastors and elders and missionaries as the dainty, common, simple-minded men who are more like George Costanza than Chuck Norris, right? But oftentimes, the Bible describes them as these, as these great apostles and elders as soldiers, Green Berets, Delta Team Six. Can I get an amen, Right? That these Christians were something more, that there was, they were, well, I was going to say jarheads, but I've met some of those guys and I don't want to be one of them. So listen, he says we are soldiers in the gospel. Epaphroditus was a soldier. He had borne the scars of the battle. Apparently, Epaphroditus was always equipped for the fight, the apostle was saying, and he was ready to enter the stage. He didn't allow the apostle to take the shellings on his own, but there was, he was always there in the trenches, laboring and defending the ground of the gospel with him. Beloved, it takes special men and women to do that for another. It's not special to point out another person's faults. It's not special to point out a leader's shortcomings. Everybody does that. It's easy to do so. It's special when a person dives in and fights alongside them, when they dig into the trenches, as it were. Not only was he a brother, not only was he a fellow worker, not only was he a fellow soldier, but then he says that he was the messenger in the time of need. By the way, that they would choose him to be their messenger speaks a great amount about his quality and his character. Have you ever been around those people who in the time of your need somehow to find a way to make, uh, make uh, your, your story, uh, make you sorry for them? Ever been sitting there and somebody's got something terrible going on and and, and, and you're sitting there and somebody shows up and they start talking to them and, 
And I think sincerely they, they seek to comfort them, but all of a sudden they start telling their own stories. And you start feeling more bad for that person than you did the person you came to encourage. Nobody's ever done that, okay? I've done it. I've sat there and I've thought, now listen, folks, this is not about you. This is, this is not about what's going on in your life. Listen, this guy is dying. He don't care. Amen? But sometimes that's how we act. When you consider that this labor, whatever it was, this journey, left Epaphroditus sick, even nearing to death, it is quite remarkable that this would be the chosen messenger of the church to minister to the pastor in his time of need. Epaphroditus did not show up and say to the Apostle Paul, you're in prison? Great, listen, I got really sick. He didn't say to him, I know you're going through a difficult trial, and I know that this has been tough on you, but, but listen, I've had my own battles. Would you pray for me? It speaks also to the trust that the church had with him, that of all the people they might have considered in the church, that they would want to send this fellow. They saw in Epaphroditus a character in this man that was worth sending him above everybody else. I'm sure like other churches, there were other great men and women. But when they looked at Epaphroditus, they said, this is the guy to send. I think that his character, by the way, is shown in his care for them while he was sick. The reason the church had selected him was because of his appearance. Now let me explain. I'm not talking about him as a beautiful, handsome man. Epaphroditus means, the name means lovely or gracious. The name means that he was lovely or gracious in appearance. But what made him lovely and gracious in appearance was something else. It was humility. Some of the most physically attractive people in all the world are a total turnoff to people because of the pride and the arrogance that protrudes from their life. But Epaphroditus had a humble spirit that made him lovely. He had a humility about him where when he was sick, he was thinking about how that would affect other people. When he was selected to minister to the Apostle Paul in a difficult hour, he did not shrink away. He had a humility about him, a character about him that apparently made him lovely and precious, gorgeous for people to be around. You met those folks as well, right? When they sit down in your living room, you just enjoy the time. The time goes by so fast because they have a lovely disposition. Now watch how Paul says that the people should respond to such men. First, he says that they should receive him with joy upon his return. He understood that the message that would be sent back wasn't going to be great. Paul was still in prison and perhaps even nearing unto death. But they were to receive this message, this emissary, with joy, Paul says, because he has labored faithfully on your behalf. They weren't to bombard him with questions immediately to wear him out, but they were to experience the joy of welcoming home a family member who's come back from battle. Second, he says that they were to honor such men. Sometimes in the church, we get the wrong impression about what it means to honor somebody. Rightfully, we assert that people should do what they do with no expectation of public acknowledgement. You should not ever do something because you want other people to acknowledge it, to pat you on the back, to tell you what a wonderful, great person you are. Jesus told his disciples not to allow the left hand, uh, not to let the left hand know what the right hand was doing. That what we do, that we do our deeds in secret, seeking no credit, that the Father who sees all may reward us eternally. But in that thought process, we have lost sight of a time-honored principle that there is a time and place to honor and respect those who have served us along the way. Those who have labored in our path. Psalm 102 verse 18, we are told to write these things down. That the generation that has not yet been created may praise the Lord having heard those things. There is a time and a season to honor those who serve us faithfully. But the key, I think, is that Epaphroditus never sought that honor. It was requested on the part of the apostle. Those who seek to be honored are put to shame. They do their works for the wrong reasons. And Paul contrasts, he says that others are serving you out of selfish ambition. But beloved, it is our responsibility as the church to open our eyes, to take our eyes off of ourselves, and to honor those who serve us faithfully. 
What most of the time happens when you honor someone is somebody in the audience says, well, they didn't honor me. Didn't they remember that I was out here that day? Didn't they remember the work that I had done? Beloved, that attitude is antithetical to the gospel community. We are supposed to not look at ourselves, take our eyes off of ourselves and to see Christ Jesus. And in seeing Christ Jesus, we will see men and women who serve us faithfully. And Paul says, like Epaphroditus, you should receive them with joy and honor them for their service. Let me wrap up this section of scripture with some simple application. We said that we were going to answer two questions. The first was, what do these friendships, the friendship between Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus, what do they teach us about the nature of friendship with other believers in Christ? I'm going to give you five things. First of all, they show us through Epaphroditus and Timothy, they were trustworthy to the Apostle Paul. They had a proven track record. That is that you and I, as we look at these friendships, we learn that real friends are trustworthy. Second of all, that real friendship is intimate. More than just a superficial relationship, it is something special. It is something deeper. It is something like a familial bond. I'm going to get back to that in a few moments. Third, we learned that that, uh, through these men that he was a brother, that there is a shared faith experience that takes time in gospel friendships that will prove whether or not a friendship is real. Fourth, real friendship shares the labor. No one looked unto themselves to do all of the work, but rather they shared the labor. And fifth and finally, gospel friendships are, are made for battle. They are soldiers, as it were. They gather together and engage with one another. What does a gospel friendship look like? It is one where you find trustworthiness, intimacy, uh, companionship through shared faith experience, laboring together, serving, sharing the load, and finally, engaged in the battle together instead of shooting one another. Second, we have to ask the question, what do these friendships teach us about the nature of the gospel and the church, the local church? Step away from individuals and look at the local church. Well, they teach us, first of all, that the gospel provides a relationship with others that is not able to be found or discovered anywhere else. Attributes of friendship are selflessness, sacrifice, commitment, right? Those things are the gospel itself, personified in the person of Jesus Christ. By its very nature, the gospel teaches us how to do those things because we don't do them on our own. We're not selfless people on our own. We're not, we're not given over to sacrifice and commitment on our own. But the gospel teaches us those things. In fact, most of the time, if we were to be honest, we base our relationships on compatibility, right? Right? Do I like that person? Are they like me? Do they think like me? Do they do what I do? Do we do enjoy the same hobbies and interests, right? That's why the pastor has to have hobbies like golfing and fishing and, and, and all the list just goes on and hunting and, and on down the list because I'm just trying to relate to you. The gospel flips such things on their head as, 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 as pride and arrogance and selfishness. The gospel shows us that friendships become about sacrifice and selflessness toward one another. And only Jesus can teach us how to do that. Second, despite what you might think, it also shows us that Christianity was never intended to be a solo on the stage. That that Christianity was never meant to be something that you experience by yourself. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. All of them have a tanto. We often operate in the church as though we need nobody else. I'll just do things my way. And if other people don't like it, well, they can just get over it. Amen? Preacher, I don't understand why nobody listens to me. I don't understand why nobody agrees with me. I don't understand why other people aren't passionate like me. Beloved, it does not work that way. God gave us friendships in the local church and partnerships in the gospel, listen, for our good. I'm thankful that not everybody's passionate about what you're passionate about. If they were, it would not be a church. We need each other to accomplish God's purposes in the local congregation. We need folks that don't always think the way we think. 
We need folks who don't always act like we act. We need folks that do, who do something different than we often do. And we need, listen to me, to support one another in our differences. This is a lesson that is hard to learn sometimes, I think. When we look at what the church is doing or offering or, or, or whatever it may be, our first reaction is oftentimes, well, that's not really something I'm interested in. They're going to do a Sunday night service. Well, that's fine and dandy, but that's not really something I'm interested in. Well, they're doing Celebrate Recovery, but that's not something I'm really interested in. Well, they're offering an opportunity for service in the children's department, but that's not something I'm really interested in. You getting sick of it? Me too. Sometimes, beloved, listen, it is good to attend things you are not interested in. Sometimes it is good to be a part of things that are not your particular interest. And here's why. Number one, it encourages the friends that you support them in their work. It tells them, hey, I hate it. This is stupid, but I'm with you all the way, right? This is, this is what happens in our home from time to time. Kelly, I totally disagree, but I am with you to the end of the line. Let's do it. Come on, right? You think I'm kidding. Sometimes a friendship in the local congregation is simply about saying, hey, I'm with you. It may, not, it may not be something that I like. It may not be something that particularly interests me. But listen, I'll support you by simply being involved. And also, secondly, sometimes we find out that God sovereignly placed those people in our lives, in our life to teach us something new. Even maybe give us a burden for something different. I was having this conversation uh, with some, some young men this week, I was asked to go and be a part of a, a Bible study uh, in the Slavic community. And man, I had the time of my life. They said, we're going to start Bible study at 7 p.m. I got there and I said, how long do you all normally go? Because I want to try to be conscientious of your time. And they're like, oh, we just, you know, whenever we're done. At 1 a.m. when I came stumbling in the house, Kelly said, what happened to you? Listen, only a preacher could stumble into his home at 1 a.m. and say, I've just been in a Bible study, right? <laughs> Nobody else could get away with it. But in that conversation, in that community, we were having a conversation about how God puts burdens on our lives. In our lives, he gives us a passion for things. And somebody intuitively asked, how do you get a passion for something? Well, how do you get a passion for anything? Well, you get involved. How did I get a passion for India? I went to India. How do you get a passion for Mardi Gras? You go to Mardi Gras one time. As you saturate yourself in that endeavor, guess what happens? God begins to change your mind about something. God begins to give you a burden about it. So the reason that even though somebody offers something that may not be appealing to us, we still go and be a part of it is because, number one, it encourages them. And number two, sometimes God gives us an unexpected passion for his glory in an area we thought we wouldn't be interested in at all. Beloved, even, let me go a step further, our giving in the local church is a reflection of our friendship. Do we want our friends to bear the burden by themselves? I've had friends that have asked for money over the years from me, and sometimes we've obliged, sometimes we haven't. It's a part of friendship. I don't want to give my money away to somebody who's not a friend. Now, that may be a spiritual sin, but it's the reality. Friendship doesn't make their other friends bear the burden all by itself. It seems like for many, there are two types of people in their life. Maybe I could illustrate it like this. There are givers and there are takers. Givers are the people, you know them well. We go to when we need something. We say, hey, I need you to pray for me. I need you to help me in this. I need you to, to encourage me. Takers are the people in our lives who come to visit us only when they need something. People can awfully be awfully needy these days, you know what I mean? Ministry can be messy. Friendship can be messy. But Paul is showing us through his friendship with Epaphroditus and Timothy that true gospel friendship is a two-way street. It gives when the object of its affection needs, and it takes when it is the one in need. In fact, I found this story that I find very comical. If It, it would be very comical if it were not so true. It's an anonymous author. Don't know whether it's really true. I assume it's not. It's probably meant to be a parable. But listen to how the story goes. A voyaging ship was wrecked during a storm at sea, and only two of the men on it were able to swim 
to a small deserted island. The two survivors, who had been good friends, not knowing what else to do, agreed that they had no other recourse except to pray to God. However, to find out whose prayer was more powerful and effective, they agreed to divide the territory of the island between them and to stay on opposite sides of the island. They wanted to know who was the more spiritual of them. Our first indication, these are Baptist. The first thing they did was they prayed for food. The next morning, the first man saw a fruit-bearing tree on his side of the island, and he was able to eat of its fruit. The other man's parcel of land remained totally barren. After a week, the first man was lonely, and so he decided to pray for a wife. The next day, another ship was wrecked, and the only survivor was a woman who swam to his side of the island, and on the other side of the island, there was nothing. What a foolish man, praying for a woman on a deserted island. Amen? Soon, the first man prayed for a house, clothes, and more food. And the next day, like magic, all of these things were given to him. However, the second man still had nothing. Finally, the first man prayed for a ship so that he and his wife could leave the deserted island. In the morning, he found a ship docked on his side of the island. And the first man boarded the ship with his wife and decided to leave the second man behind. He considered the other man unworthy to receive God's blessing. Because... None of his prayers were answered. As the ship was about to leave port, the first man heard a voice that boomed from heaven and said, Why are you leaving your companion on the island? The man responded, My blessings are mine alone. Since I was the one who prayed for them, the first man answered, His prayers were all unanswered, and so he deserves nothing. You are mistaken, the voice rebuked. He had only one prayer, which I answered. If not for that, you would not have any of the many blessings. Tell me, the first man said to the voice, what did he pray for that I should owe him anything? The voice responded, he prayed that all your prayers would be answered. Oftentimes in life, we have these people in our lives that are givers and some that are takers. Sometimes we are givers, sometimes we are takers. But the gospel, gospel friendship, is supposed to be a two-way street. It means that I'll share my burdens with you, and you can share yours with me, and I won't demand of your time uh, any more than I would ask of you to give me some time. In fact, let me even illustrate it a little simpler really fast this morning. I love how God kind of puts things together from time to time. And this past Friday and Sunday, I was thinking about, or Saturday, I was thinking about how do I explain what real friendship is supposed to look like? And I had a great opportunity to teach my son in that prayer about what friendship is supposed to be. And I love the innocence of a six-year-old. I asked him if he had new friends at school, and he said, yes. I said, what's their name? He says, I don't remember them. I said, what do you mean you don't remember them? He says, there's too many. I said, what do you mean there's too many? Well, all of them are my friends, Dad. So I thought, well, I'm going to teach him something about life. Amen. The first encounter I had was with a man who calls me regularly. We were standing, Isaiah and I were outside at the golf course, walking back to the truck, and this fella just happened to holler my name. I didn't see him standing over there, and I hadn't actually spoken to him in a few weeks, and I went over to him, and we began to talk, and Isaiah didn't know him because he'd never seen him at church or anything like that, and the man proceeded with his normal sense of questioning. How's the church? Looks great out there. How's the girls' golf team? How's your family? Tell me about those things. Nearing the end of the conversation, I realized I had never introduced Isaiah to him. And so I said, Isaiah, I want you to meet dad's friend. And the man began to talk to Isaiah about whatever six-year-olds find interesting. As we moved from that conversation and began to work our way to the truck, another gentleman pulled up and he started talking to me as well. He's one of those guys that I've known for six, seven years, I guess you would say. And you develop a type of business relationship with over the years, right? You know what I mean, where you don't ever talk about anything on a personal level. The conversations are much more geared about non-personal things. We get back in the truck, and Isaiah says, Dad, what was your friend's name? So I told him the first man's name, and he said, no, 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 what was your other friend's name? After a while, having figured out what he was talking about, I tried every reasonable illustration I knew to explain to him that 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 doesn't make you a friend just because you talk to someone. Till finally Isaiah, getting frustrated, decided that it was more worthwhile to talk about dinosaurs, and we moved on. 
Saturday morning comes along, the heating element in our dryer had gone out, and so we went up to the laundromat, and he was not being a friend of mom. So I said, Isaiah, why don't you come to the laundromat with me? While we were there, a gentleman that I and this church have over the years helped on many occasions came walking up to us and began talking to us, right? Because we were kind of wrapping up. He started talking, and, and after just a few minutes, I knew where the conversation was headed, but Isaiah wasn't sure. And all of a sudden, he turned his attention to, could the church pay for this? Could I borrow a few dollars from you, pastor? When we got back in the truck, Isaiah's first words again were, Dad, is that guy your friend? In our world, beloved, we think about the neighbor that we are called to love as being equal to friendship. But beloved, that's simply just not the case, nor was it ever intended to be so. I can love my neighbor, but friendship in the gospel is reserved for an intimate relationship. You see, we have to protect our inner circle, so to speak. Friendship isn't something that we simply hand around. It requires a certain level of intimacy. It requires trust and mutual shared values and a willingness to work together to engage in the battle as it were. But the beauty of the gospel is its ability to make enemies, men and women who are not prone to relationship, listen, friends. That's the beauty of the gospel. That you and I today could be friends. We being so different, some of you being nerds and liking to do crossword puzzles and others liking to do things that I like to do and the list goes on and on and on. Some of you being a PETA supporter and others being NRA supporters, whatever it is, that we could be so different. And yet the gospel makes enemies into friends. The gospel through humility, shared sacrifice, shared values radically transforms our relationships to a point that then I can share your burdens and you can share mine. Beloved, the, friend, the gospel brings us friendship with God, but it also brings us friendship within the local church. You should know the person to your right and to your left. You should love them and long for intimacy with them. You should long, in short, to be their friend because that's how the community of faith is restored and ready for battle. Stand with me reverently and let's pray.